Hello and welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly discussions with football practitioners around the world. And uh, yeah, we've got a wonderful show lined up for you today. Where I'll be joined by Matthew Lacombe, who's the Chief Performance and Analytics Officer at Parma, Sudeshan Gopaladesikan, who's Head of Football Intelligence, Intelligence at Atalanta, and Greg Broughton, who's Technical Director at Blackburn Rovers. Um, but before I uh, properly uh, introduce you to those guys, um, let me just tell you a little bit about the discussion you will see and take part in today. Okay, so today we will be discussing maximizing the use of data to support strategic decision making. Um, after our introductions, uh, Greg, Sudeshan and Matthew will sort of give very brief presentations to give you an overview of, of their work around this topic. Well, then we get into the deeper discussion where we will hit on these key topics of how you go about maximizing data use and using that approaches to the strategic decision-making process, making that data use functional. So understanding what the key metrics you're, you are uh, in the various departments that you're, you're working in. And then when you're sort of formulating and working around this decision-making plan, how you're sort of creating that narrative, presenting your ideas using you and findings using data. Um, but so we can get a little bit deeper into that. Let me start introducing you to today's guests. Um, we'll start with Matthew Lacombe, who I think is probably the happiest of us all today. Uh, after France's win yesterday. Um, Matthew, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good, thank you. Um, glad to be here today as well, and uh, especially after a good win of the French national team. So it's, it's pretty nice. Um, just a bit of background about myself. So I'm currently Chief Performance Analytics Officer in Parma. I joined the, the club 18 months ago with kind of uh, the ambition to restructure uh, performance on one side and uh, data analytics on the, on the other side with a big uh, objective set by the ownership group to get more into informed-based decisions or data-informed decisions uh, and supporting all key stakeholders with in the decision making process with with data before that i spent six or seven years six years i think in paris saint germain uh, in france going into different world from uh, sports science head of research head of research and innovation and uh even before that uh i stepped back from football and i was uh, i was uh, in uh, in rugby at the french uh, french rugby union so spent some 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 time there pretty interesting fantastic oh, i didn't know that you'd uh, had that background in rugby union to begin with uh, i i think to uh, put some some kicks sometimes <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that matthew and our second guest uh, on here today is uh, Sudeshango Paladesikan, who uh, is a co-author of the book, uh, Football Intelligence, uh, hands -on maximizing, a hands-on guide to maximizing your investments in data along, along with Matthew. Um, and obviously their presentations will, will give you a little overview of that. But before we get there, Sudeshan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, thank you, Steve, for, for having me for today's Sunday session. Um, and thank you, Greg and Matthew, to share the same platform. Um, yeah, um, so I'm currently based in Italy, uh, working for the club Atalanta. Uh, prior to that, uh, I spent five years or five seasons with um, Benfica as the head of sports data science, uh, really focusing on uh, academy development, first team, and dabbling a little bit in multi-sport environments, because uh, Benfica has around... Uh, five other key sports that they they invest in for, for cultural and competitive purposes. Um, and then prior to Benfica, I was uh, four or five years in Microsoft, um, having a very solid West Coast US tech life. Um, but uh, I think, and that even though I didn't play ever professionally, even though I just played in college and things like this, I always felt something was missing when I saw it, when I had my last game, when I played my last game. 
Um, so it's it's been a real pleasure and joy to actually be able to to work in football. Um, and then prior to that, I studied mathematics. And prior to that, I was born. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, best best stop that story there. We don't want to get any into any more details prior to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Suds. Uh, finally, um, Greg Broughton. How are you doing today, Greg? Yeah, good. Um, not a good day on the football pitch yesterday. Uh, two defeats. My club, Blackburn Rovers, lost home in a local derby against Preston. The data would back up that performance as well. And then last night, sitting through England against France, where the data wouldn't back up the performance, but still crashing out of the World Cup. So... Um, but still, we start again today, and it's a pleasure to start here on a Sunday morning with you all. So thank you for having me. Ah, it's a pleasure, Greg. Yes, as you say, it's a new day, a new start. Um, exactly. But yeah, let's first of all start with, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about your your background that's brought you to Blackburn Rovers. Yeah, well, um, I've, I've been here since June um, as the role of technical director. So overseeing the football side of the club, the sporting side of the club. Previous to that, I had five years in Norway, working with a small club in the north of Norway called Buda Glimt. Um, and previous to that, I was working with two clubs in England, um, Norwich City, where I was the academy director, and then previously head of player recruitment, and Luton Town, uh, the same journey, head of player recruitment and academy director. Um, so I've gone through my coaching journey as a, as a pro licensed coach, but I would see myself more as a, a, my expertise is more in player recruitment than it is in coaching. So I went through my talent ID qualifications with the Football Association as well and, and completed my technical director's license um, with the FA maybe two years ago now. OK, fantastic. And I think without uh, any further ado, then we'll uh, we'll jump straight into today's presentations. Um, we'll follow the same order as uh, as you was introduced. So uh, we've tossed the coin and, and Matthew, you've you've won. OK. Can you hear me? Can you see the presentation? Yep, hearing okay. you and seeing you. Um, just very small presentation to introduce uh, the topic. But as uh, as you said, um, we spent the last two, uh, eighteen or twenty four months uh, writing a book with uh, with Suds and uh, another person called uh, Eva Murray um, about what we call football intelligence. So basically, we everything starts back with um, a study from uh, so McKinsey, explaining very simple things that everyone knows. Uh, that if you want to be successful in football, uh, you need to be able to increase your team market value. To do this, you have two main options: one, um, just invest more money in the team, and we want it to stay away from from this part. The whole uh, other part of uh, increasing your team market value is about um, creating strategic uh, value, what they call strategic value, and that rely on three main pillars. Uh, one, trading excellence. So knowing how to uh, buy player cheap and selling them at a more expensive price. Second, it's about talent development, mainly how, how you manage first team and, and the gap between the uh, uh, your like, second or under 19 to, uh, to first team and develop talent in house. And the, the third part was about uh, youth academy leverage. So this is what more or less football is about. But again, you know, football is a kind of very complex environment um, and uh, very uncertain. Uh, and while everyone is doing uh, mistakes, we believe that uh, data need to be embedded in uh, decision-making processes to reduce this uncertainty. And basically, this is why we call the book, just to go through how, uh, as a football club, you can invest uh, in data to reduce this uncertainty and get your team improve along the way uh, on, a, on a kind of short to short to long term. Basically, the book is like six chapters, uh, the first three ones are talking about um, strategy, um, measurement of, uh, of progress, and uh, execution of, uh, of projects. Um, so the, the, the first, first chapters uh, is diving into how can you 
uh, first set up your club strategy and then or can you set up a data strategy that will be aligned uh, with your with your overall club strategy so of course there is like no one size fits all methodology uh, to do that but we try to propose a framework to to support people in creating the, the data strategy going through a more discovering phase understanding why you are doing that uh what are your key challenges uh where are the the, the gaps going through what we call more strategy plannings so what are your key activities uh, who are your clients what are your resources can who can be your external partners and, and people so at the end to define what is your value proposition as a data uh department for the club and moving to like road mapping and uh, project priorizations we went to the second uh, chapter talking about measurements. So when you have your strategy, uh, how can you start measuring that you are on the right uh, on the right path? And uh, this is all about setting right KPIs for the for your club or setting up uh, what we call OKRs, objective and key results, and tracking them. So we go a bit in depth on talking what can be lagging metrics, leading metrics, uh, who could be, we try to brainstorm what could be good metrics for your club, depending on your objective. Is it talent development, uh, trading uh, excellence, or leveraging use in the, from, from the academy? And um, okay, planning is nice, but you need at some point to execute projects. Uh, so we start to, bring some concepts that are more from uh, the tech industry and try to see how these could be applied uh, into more of a football environment. Uh, and, ooh. and so this is more about um, uh, priorization of projects, getting into backlog, uh, running what we call sprints, and we can dive a bit into, into all of this methodology just to make sure that you uh, go at the, like steady state of uh, building stuff for your club and uh, moving along and you don't be trapped into this like hectic 11 month sprints, one month rest um, that we, we all, we all, uh, we all know in uh, happen in football. And last, uh, last part of, of the book and I don't know if we're going to we're going to run in, in, in this today, but uh, was about for us technology, people, and uh, communication with data. And we tr just try to ally that um, to be successful, uh, you need to make sure that you have the three perfectly aligned good data and good technology stack for, for your club, good people. And so we spent we spend some few times because we, 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 we believe that. I wouldn't say it's a missing element in most of the club, but uh, there is very few clubs that are thinking uh, proactively about how do we attract the best talent in, or do we retain them, or do we manage them, and how do we just make sure they are not they are not leaving the club. And the and the last part was about communicating with with data. And that's it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. It's kind of nice. Yeah, overview of uh, of of the book and and what the sort of key areas we'll uh, we'll get a little bit deeper into uh, later in uh, the discussion. But uh, yeah, for now, I think to hop on the back of that, then we'll hand over to your co-author Suds. Mm, sure, I will add some continuity to what Matthew just spoke about, um, Matthew gave a really good uh, framework or backbone uh, skeletal structure of what the book uh, talks about. Maybe in the slides that I'm gonna show a little bit, it will uh, be more on um, what is the role of football intelligence crossed with data? How does that actually maybe manifest itself? Give some concrete examples. Uh, but first, before I, before I get into that, I'd like to share a video of, um, a friendly discussion between a sporting director and the head coach of some team. Um, and uh, to just give a sense of 
how things might happen if good processes or um, the right alignment is not in place. Hopefully the video came through on on that. Uh, sorry, hopefully the sound came through on that video. Um, the, the the things I find interesting about that video are maybe two two key things. One is the actual bust up that happens, the argument that happens um, between a sporting director and the head coach, uh, and then two is the sort of subtle video filming, yet it still leaks out online. So. The person is making sure that he doesn't have like a really clear view of getting like a video of the whole thing, but there's like some sneak element happening to it. And um, it's not a very transparent environment, as you can see. It's, it, it feels very secret. It feels very secretive. It feels like there is not a free flow of information um, and there is perhaps maybe not the right trust and uh, compassion um, involved between the key people within the club. And so um, starting with Matthew's um, first slide, which is what are the key things that maybe clubs take strategic decisions around? Um, these are maybe trading excellence, talent development, youth academy leverage. <clears throat> and so trading excellence, you might have a strategic decision in terms of, okay, uh, how do we want to um, create multiple horizon planning uh, regarding this, this winter 22, 23 market? Uh, how does that bleed into or how does that translate into how we might uh, tackle um, next summer's market? And then like, how are we looking for more long-term long -term trades? Uh, this could be maybe strategic decisions around um, the player's book value on how they're amortizing based on the performances and all that. And maybe you might want to have some information or data to be able to make really good multiple horizon planning decisions based on based on player trading. Talent development, you might have a strategic uh, decision to make in terms of how much do we want to uh, invest into our academy, whether that's personnel, whether that's infrastructure, whether that is scouting to be able to find not only the best talent in the region, but to be able to incentivize them. So a um, lot of decisions need to be made in terms of how do we want to actually invest in creating talent development. Um, and then youth academy, uh, sorry, so talent development, would be, sorry, youth academy leverage would be that talent development in the first team um, might be a, a decision in terms of how do we actually want to create uh, some sort of um, player support framework where the head coach really works with the players on the pitch, but then off the pitch, how are we actually supporting the player and what sort of uh, decisions can we make there, even if it's like hiring a player welfare officer. Um, what are some sort of decisions we can make there to be able to make sure that we are developing the talent that we do end up bringing in? Um, so each of these questions are things that every every key executive within the football club thinks about. Uh, each of these questions are um, things that clubs decide on whether or not they have data. And each of these things are clubs have had success with, with and without data. Um, I think the interesting thing or the important thing is maybe to draw some reference from NBA or MLB or something like this. Um, I'm, I'm currently having the privilege of, of working closely with the Boston Celtics right now. And one thing that I've seen is, okay, they might have, they might not have won an NBA title uh, yet, and maybe this year might be the year that they do it. 
but they're consistently making it to uh, deep stage playoffs every year. And so maybe the thing is, is you'll always be able to find moments where data did not help the team to be successful or you might be able to find moments where teams are very successful without following a data-driven strategy. But I think the, the whole ethos of football intelligence is that we're just trying to find success. We're trying to find replicable methods of success. So maybe we don't hit the peaks of winning Champions League every year, but we are hitting consistently being a net profitable business while, while being a top six club in Serie A. And, and to be honest, if, if, if a team is able to do something like this consistently year over year, that, that is pretty, pretty successful. Um, so I think the role of football intelligence might not be winning a World Cup, but it might be just we are able to be successful, a baseline level of success. We're able to replicate that because we have tried and true and proven methods that work um, and we have proof and evidence that they work. So. Um, the role of intelligence effectively is is then is then fourfold. Um, it's it's to help key decision makers learn things that the organization didn't know before. So um, this could be a, a good example of this. Could be uh, you have a loan to buy option for a player, and um, the buy option seems to be very expensive. But actually, if you look into the market you actually see someone of his talent is in line with what is the market rate for other people that are not having a loan to buy option, but they have to just like straight buy the player. And so sometimes you can help a club by learning new information. Um, things that we thought we knew, but were wrong. Um, maybe there is a player that we are wrongly evaluating with our eyes. Um, and actually with data, with maybe some of the event providers you see here on the left, we're able to better evaluate and better create a performance metric for, for how the person does. And so maybe with, with our peer eyes, we just say, oh, this person's not a good player, but maybe data might tell us something differently. Maybe the data might say, oh, the player is actually better than we thought. Um, intelligence also helps a lot with actually just confirming things that we do know so um something like this could be ah yeah we're, we're really uh uh we're getting older our team is getting older it's like okay it's probably pretty obvious probably everyone knows that the whole world knows that it's not secret information um but it's really good to be able to visualize that it's very good to be able to add some clarity some precision to to something that we already know like okay we're getting older but like what positional groups are we really really getting older um what sort of roles uh like the players that are getting older what sort of roles are they carrying on the team on and off the pitch things like that and then things that we thought we knew but lacked clarity and precision could be um something about you know we, we we know this defender is very we know this defender is good uh but we don't necessarily know like sorry no i give a good example we we know that we're not so good in defensive transitions but we don't really understand like what exactly is going wrong in our defensive transitions so maybe we just want to add a little bit of of precision and clarity around like what is it exactly about defensive transitions that that we're having a hunch about and so in order to be able to do that, um, clubs, uh, some clubs invest in different data providers around the, uh, like uh, different data providers that do different things. So StatsBomb does event-based data. It's more like on the ball information. So every single event that happens on the ball, we have uh, data for that. And then things like Second Spectrum, they'll have information about uh, the location of all 22 players on the field and things like that to, to um, physical data. And then maybe if the club has a data scientist in-house to be able to develop uh, in-house metrics. And just to end, the, the, the whole idea is the world is just like a changing land. Uh, the world is a changing landscape. Um, and the goal is to try to be ahead of the curve, trying to find what are like the new modern replicable methods. And so for a place like Atalanta or not just Atalanta, it could be any smart club that you think of, um, a lot of the methods that we, or not me, but a lot of the methods that the club used back in the day are now being much more harder to be used because teams like Leeds and Aston Villa 
have now good infrastructure in place and they have Premier League money to be able to buy the same players that we were once looking at five, six years ago. But they can obviously incentivize those players with a higher salary point and um, pay a bit larger transfer fee. So the role of intelligence helps teams that have lost competitive advantages find, find new methods of, of replicable success. And so to the right, you just have some, some examples of how, how intelligence might actually help. Um, so the, the last is just to have an appreciation of process, have like an understanding of like the key roles and responsibilities. Um, data will always be important, but the traditional methods will always be replaceable. If you can just be very simple, it's better. Um, we're all in this together. Not everyone is data driven within an organization, um, but they, they want to be. And even if they're not, they're still interested in it because it's a new sexy thing. So the more simple your message can be, the better. And nothing is ever really built in one window. Um, if you are, you've won the lottery. So maybe just one word is, is patience. Um, you really should buy into a football intelligent method. Uh, if not, uh, don't bother, don't have it. P teams have been successful without following data, without following good process. So um, you have to really buy into this. Uh, it's not a one window transformation for, for creating replicable methods of success. So I, I hope that covers a little bit of how football intelligence could be used, some examples, and looking forward to the rest of the, the session. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you, Studs. Um, so we can get into that discussion. We'll uh, roll very quickly on to our third and final presentation for today. And Greg, the screen is all yours. Good. Well, uh, as you said at the beginning, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm going to try and show some examples of how we have started to bring data and information into our decision making process at Blackburn Rovers. Um, and it's a new project here at the club. Um, my role as technical director or director of football is a new role as well. Previously, the club had a, a more traditional English manager driving the process. And we've tried to align to what I'd probably describe as a more modern structure where we have my role overseeing the sporting side uh, with the head coach, obviously overseeing everything that happens on the pitch. But I think what it comes down to is just having the best information you can have whenever it comes to a critical junction. Whenever you have to make a key decision, the information should support you with that decision-making process. Um, one of the studies I did for my, my dissertation for my technical director's license was about the use of metrics in the modern game. Um, and I leaned heavily on the tyranny of metrics by Jerry Muller. My study was about the use of Goodhart's law or, or the effective, effectiveness of Goodhart's law in football. Uh, Goodhart's law states that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become an effective measure. Uh, in other words, that people begin to game it and people begin to cheat in order just to hit the target. So it's how to measure your club without it necessarily becoming a target. And for us, um, several things that underpin performance. One of the most simplest is just looking at the quality of chances created and the quality of chances conceded. And although we sat third in the table, going in into the uh, international window four weeks ago, or international break four weeks ago, uh, the data suggested that we were very much overperforming um, and that we probably sat middle of the table, maybe 10 or 11 points behind what we actually had. So in that point of view, it's trying to keep expectations real, making sure that that's communicated externally as well as internally within the club. Um, and also it's maybe just understanding the reasons for that, because we have a very good goalkeeper, Thomas Kaminsky, who was very unlucky to miss out on the Belgian squad, who'd made crucial saves at times in games. And in terms of having Ben Brereton Diaz and, and Sam Gallagher as a striking force, they can score goals where other strikers maybe in the championship don't. So at, the, at both ends of the field, you have difference makers as well. Um, Without wanting to see that we've collaborated, I promise you we hadn't, I hadn't spoken with the other guys on the call today, um, the, the piece of research from McKinsey underpins a lot of the work that we try and do to, to look at how we measure success at Blackburn Rovers. Uh, I won't go into this slide because the guys have already described it very, very well. But what I will talk about a little bit is, is measuring the value of your squad, if, if that's the ultimate uh, takeout from McKinsey's study. Um, we are building something more robust than relying on transfer market data. But for now, just using transfer markets data alone, 
you can see the squad value there at Blackburn Rovers from promotion back to the championship in September or in the, in the summer of 2018 um, and a steady increase. But it's not it's not a consistent line. There will always be ups and downs in that now. And also we have to understand that you can sometimes have one player who throws that data. So you have a huge value placed on Ben Brereton Diaz within our squad right now, which means that the squad value overall isn't dramatically different to how it was um, in, in September. But what it comes back to is then how do you uh, appoint your head coach to fit in with that model? One of the key takeouts from McKinsey's study. Um, this was a piece of research I did with working with uh, the 21st club in London with Omar and the guys there at a previous club when we were looking uh, to identify a potential head coach, should we have to change? Uh, we came up with 20 different metrics in four different areas as on the screen there. And, and had that done for different um, scenarios as well, whether we were playing in one level of competition or another level of competition. Um, and that piece of data had thrown up Jondal Thomason as a coach who had done very, very well at Malmo, won the Swedish championship two years in a row, managed to get Malmo into the group stages of, of the, uh, uh, sorry, the group stage of the Champions League as well. And um, that process meant that when I came to Blackburn Rovers, I also had a, a an oversight of coaches who might be able to achieve some of the stuff, because obviously this model is a little bit different to what we were trying to do at Blackburn Rovers, but some of the stuff that we were also looking to do. And that brought Yondal into consideration when we, when we appointed the head coach in, in June this year. Also, I think it's about looking to see how you measure success within your academy and internally as well. Uh, these are some of the numbers that the Midland use for measuring success in their academy. And again, this has to be context specific. It can't be correct for, for every club you're working in. But what I thought as well, and, and I know we talked early about um, leading and lagging indicators as well, because quite often, if you look at productivity within your academy, it, it is a lagging indicator. It tells you maybe of the work that took place two, three, sometimes even five to 10 years ago. So what Mietland do is look at uh, over a five year rolling average um, of both players in the team, but also players who are 17, 18, who are knocking on the door. Because if you don't have 17 and 18 year olds knocking on the door, it probably says that in three to four years time, you might be struggling to have academy based players in your first team. And finally, um, just another way of measuring success is, is not just obviously uh, within uh, player sales is not just um, the sale value of a player that comes from your club but also the savings you're having from those players playing and, and getting time in your first team compared to if you've had to go out and purchase a player at a similar, uh, in a similar position. Yeah, so that's me done and I will come off screen share there. Lovely, thank you, Greg. Yeah, that was a little excellent introduction into sort of how you stepped into the club and, and sort of the changes you, you're wanting to make there. I think before we get deeper into the discussion, just for those who are live on the call with us, um, yeah, if you want to ask any questions to Suds, Greg and Matthew, you just uh, pop down to the bottom of your screen there, there's the, the Q&A button and uh, hit that and fire your questions away to our guests and we'll get through as many of those as possible as we go through today's discussion. Um, so I think the best place to begin and maybe this is for Suds and, and Matthew to start off with, with your the little bits of research and conversations you had with people around your book. What are the sort of themes that you were think you were hearing repeatedly about how clubs are currently using their data to support their strategic decision making? And specifically, where were you sort of light bulbs are going off to you to see where those gaps were or were where Right, this is where you could be using it a little bit better. Um, so I think um, we're always constantly balancing between three things. Uh, we're always constantly balancing between active development, um, lot of, uh, like stepping into a new club like Atalanta, there is no infrastructure in place, um, no purchase of data yet. And so had to buy some data in the first place. You could use the platform as they had it, um, like the IQ StatsBomb platform or the ISF platform for, for stats performer opta data. 
you could use it as is, but maybe using it as is, it's really a tool meant for a match analyst and not really for a strategic decision, decision maker. And so you're always kind of balancing between three things, which is active development of your data infrastructure and insights. Two is live testing of what you're developing um, to create buy-in and to create uh, areas where data is being used. And then third, which is like a constant education of how data actually can help us know things that maybe are not so easily seen by, by the expert eye. And so um, I think in our, in our aspect, it's really, while doing the book, it was really honing down, like what exactly are we trying to do with information? What exactly are people trying to do with information, whether or not it's a number-based information or it's a tip that they hear from a friend or something. And it's what Greg is saying, it's we're trying to have as much information as possible on the table um, before making a decision. And so it always goes back to those things. It's like for every single thing that's important, whether it's player development, um, talent ID, um, academy pipeline, like player pathway, what exactly is it that we really know now? Are we, are we able to challenge our current beliefs? Are we willing to admit that maybe we were wrong at one point? Are we willing to update our biases? Are we able to move towards a better understanding of something? And I think while writing the book, that was probably the thing that became the, the most clear. So if I if I can add something on, on this one is we, we can see that most of the club are using data at a very operational level. So with match analysis, with some scouts and so on, but forget to go back to real decision-making processes and instead of trying to push information into systems, we need to start pulling people like 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 said into okay, understanding what is the decision making process of key stakeholders, what are the key decisions, and how can we support data. And so at the end, it's not about creating new super fancy metrics, but sometimes just being able to provide the right amount of information at the right time in the right process. And so for that, I think uh, people like us it's on, on one side kind of been pushed at a more strategic level for sure, uh, have better interaction with the decision makers and uh, as well have a bit more empathy because that sometimes it's not about getting super fun, crunching, super nice machine learning models, but just providing simple data, which are basically average, median, and, <laughs> and standard deviations. but just providing the, the, the right information to the right people. I guess with, with yourself, Greg, you're coming into the, the same space, but from a slightly different angle. Yeah, I think I, I'm not a data expert. I'm not a, I don't have a background in mathematics or a, a, any kind of sciences. So I think for me, it's, it's bringing expertise in around you to support you with that decision making and then listening to it. Um, I think Sud said earlier, there's no point doing it or employing those people's, people or systems if you're then going to ignore that when it comes to a critical decision to be made. Um, it, it's only part of the, of the decision making process, but it's a key part. Uh, and you have to listen and you have to base your, your information on that. So, for example, if I, if, if I use a very basic example now, um, going into the January transfer window now, which we're doing looking ahead to next summer's transfer window, um, we, we currently sit third in the championship, but we know performances are, are, are maybe not uh, as strong as, as the league position. We know from a from a data point of view, there's probably a 40% chance of us being in the playoffs at the end of the season, a 10% chance of being in the Premier League next year. So when you're doing that, you're doing that with a 90% certainty or 90% suggestion that you're going to be in the championship. So the key in and out decisions have to be made with that information. If you're doing it thinking we're third, we're almost there, we should be thinking about the Premier League, then maybe you're gonna waste a lot of time and energy in those decision-making processes. So there's a lot of nodding going on there. So yeah, I, I, cannot, I, cannot, no, I, just, I cannot stress enough how critical and important many clubs are probably going through what Greg, Greg just mentioned. I don't know if they have the same framework, but Greg, I think, really crystallizes why information can sometimes be very helpful. 
I mean, with that, I think we're then sort of jumping into the realms of where, like you say, you, you're building processes, processes that are reliable, yeah. repeatable, that are going to give you a certain level of success, whether it gives you that ultimate success. You know, there's so many other factors that that will lead 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 into that. So I just wonder that, what is that process then? You know, so I think with Matthew showed us a little bit of a framework of how, right, if you're beginning, how you start to build, build those processes. What are those conversations that have to go on between say uh, the, the the data departments in terms of right, this is what we're able to deliver and then people who are in Greg's position of well this is actually what we need to know so can we focus uh, uh, the data deliverables deliverables into this area I think from, from us as a football club I think it, it goes back to having absolute clarity on what your objective is and our owners objective is clarity they want to be a sustainable Premier League football club but you could probably 30 clubs in the UK, maybe even 40 clubs in the UK have a similar aim. Um, we have, a, we have a, a, a strategy of how we want to do that. We want to be the best developers of talent, both internally and externally, and give young players, be the bravest club at giving young players the opportunity in the championship. But then you've got to have your tactics that underpin that. We've got eight tactical pillars that underpin that strategy, um, of which the use of data comes heavily into supporting three or four of those pillars. Um, and I think it comes back to when, when I did my pro license, one of my mentors was, was Alistair Campbell. And he, he talked about uh, with the new labor movement when he was support, supporting Tony Blair in the mid 90s, every decision they came back to is, is it going to help us achieve, achieve our objective? And again, it comes back to that fork I showed and those decisions you're making. Is it going to help you achieve your objective? And data can really help you answer that question. And with Matthew? No, oh, so Craig say, 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 say most of it. And then uh, I, I think when this framework is, is defined, uh, it's again for me uh, to spend time with Greg and uh, sit with him and try to understand from him uh, always like when he has to make these very strategic decisions. What are the type? What is the flow of information he has in his mind, and how can I bring to him more objectivity in this? Because of course, uh, he has not a kind of supercomputer in his mind, uh, and there is some like gut feeling, of course, and there is some bias uh, as well. So I would go from okay, I don't know, trading. Uh, what is the type of information you you are looking at? Okay, I have my team. I'm doing kind of mental gap analysis. From that, I'm doing uh, uh, um, like investment, what I call investment thesis. We need this and this and this type of player. So I want this and this type of playing style. And then we we, we are moving into like finding the players, contract negotiation, and so on and so on. So, so my role would be to just take all these small parts, create a, a process, and that's every single phase of the process, try to bring the right information from okay this is a team review this is a the gap analysis we uh, we can do this is a succession plan you we have with like relevant data for for the players and then okay this is a current talent pool you have available in this and some people that can fit what you, you are looking at or your investment thesis and then we 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 go through all the, all the process that do not mean that Again, for, for this specific one, I believe in full data-driven process. And this is clearly not what we are seeing in the book. We, uh, we are more than convinced that it's a very complex environment. And it's more about getting multidisciplinary uh, visions, uh, I would say. So at some time, it's just making sure we bring the, the data in the conversation at the right moment in the framework, just to support Greg decision makings to maybe add a orthogonal idea to to what M Matthew and Greg are saying um I think our process really starts with my and, and my, my to be fair my I'm going to credit my boss fully for this not me um my boss has like a phrase saying um he said like we're, we're working he's like we're working on things but we're not really working and what he meant by that was 
if, if you went into the office on a Tuesday on a match day minus three or something like this and were preparing for the game and, and everything like that, but if you asked each and every person, uh, what does this person do? What does that person do? How does that person actually fit into uh, the work that you're doing? A lot of people probably wouldn't have been able to answer that six months ago. Um, and the, the main thing that he tried to implement being director of football was um, like a technical board meeting just once every two months, once every three months, and just have everyone go around the room and say, hey, this is what I'm working on. Um, and maybe the football administration side, maybe will never use any sort of data, but it's, it's helpful to know what they work on. Um, what sort of conversations can you have with them that are personal in nature? What sort of conversations can you have with them that are more work-related in nature? And uh, after a few technical board meetings we've had, like you can really see what he meant in the beginning, six months ago, eight months ago, which was like, yeah, we're working. Like the sports scientist is working on something. This data person is working on something. This uh, technical director is working on something. These guys are working on these deals and like everyone's working, but no one's really working together as a unit um, because not everyone was very aware of what each person brought to the table. And so even, even before having a framework or even before having a process, just like the, the first thing of everybody knowing what each person really does and what each person was working on and kind of having some, some set of accountability, like at the end of the meeting saying, hey, this is what I'm going to be showing, hopefully next technical board review of the progress I've made from the meeting that we're talking about today. I, I felt that that's been a really helpful way to actually get people to work together as a unit and as a positive consequence, actually get data more embedded into a club um, because it provides a platform for where actually data can surface into how uh, we might do football operations, how we might work with the medical staff, how we might work with the first team staff or, or whatever, whatever it may be. And so maybe that's just like the first thing that goes on prior to framework or processes, really just getting in everyone into a room and having a clear understanding of what are the roles and responsibilities and, and convert working in individual silos to really working. I think, in, I think we've touched on, well, we've certainly touched on the, 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 the transfer window in the first team. I don't know whether it's try and narrow the focus of the, discussion and when we're sort of using data to understand the value of an academy that's always a hard one i think sort of in the presentations and mentions of the investment into into that academy so and, and i guess maybe then jumping on the back of what sud said there a little bit then greg that first of all to understand what you have in the building in terms of of the people in in the building yeah, I think it's um it's about that long term succession planning. It's having a uh, very good squad design, because what I found I, I, I've talked before about the, there's three or four things that you can do to cheat the system to 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 get young players into the into the team. You can have a really high injury rate. You can have uh, a caretaker manager. You can have a transfer collapse. And there's lots of different things that you can do that aren't strategic things, but accidentally force these opportunities to happen. But what I've tried to do, or what we've tried to do at Blackburn Rovers is, is, is by having quite a tight first team squad, 20 outfield players, three goalkeepers. Um, and then we, we, at, at my, my first day at the job, the first thing I did was got all of the key academy staff around the table. I'd watched 10 or 20 under 21 and under 18 games coming into the job. And I said, right, who are the six who are closest, who, who, who need to train with the first team? And I'd written down six names and five of the six were the ones they gave me. So we put one more in that, that they've been me. We said, right, this core group of six are going to train with the whole of with, for the whole of preseason with the first team and, and be part of the group. And what you've done by by doing that then is, is two of those players forced themselves into the 22 man squad. They broke through the glass ceiling and, and were, were suddenly in there. Um, and one of those wasn't prepared to sign a long-term contract with, with us at that stage. But by the time he'd broken through and played three or four starts in the championship at the age of 17, all of a sudden was knocking on the door saying, yeah, I'm ready to sign that, that, that long-term contract now. So I think what it's, what's really, really important is having uh, the people who work with those young players every single day is giving them a voice at the top table. I've worked a lot of time in, in the academy system and I've, I've often felt frustrated that first team coaches 
don't trust them they don't believe in it and, and i understand it's their job that's on the line i get i get that completely but i think now that i'm a technical director the key thing is give the head coach a framework to work with the 22 or the 20 plus three man squad is completely his to decide who's in it or who's not in it but outside of that the club says in that case that this is the structure you have to work with and then things naturally begin to happen if you do that and that's one way of knowing what's in the building. And then you can use the data to assess those players and see how accurate the eyes of the academy staff are as well. Um, with Matthew and, and, and Suds, um, I mean, it's, I guess it's the, it seems the obvious measure of, of success for an academy is, is the number of players who come through to play in the first team. Obviously, there's lots of... Yeah, I... I... I jump on the on, on this one quickly because um I, I, I like what Greg said in his presentation. Um you need to be careful with when you set up your KPIs in between what is your kind of what we call lagging metrics. So just looking purely at revenues, that is measure of success, but you need to make sure that you are putting into your measurement system some more lagging metrics that can give you ideas of what's gonna happen. Uh, of course, it's more forecasting, but making sure you are putting the right success pieces uh, for success to happen in the in the future. And so, uh, when we start thinking about okay, our metrics design for the academy, of course, there is revenues. Of course, we need to be careful with uh, revenues or savings for the first team. This is two ones, but then you need to start looking at okay, how many players are getting some some minutes from the academy into the first team how many players are playing overage as a different uh in the different uh, groups or, or, or teams how many players are getting up minutes overage with a, like consistency in performance and then you you can go deep and deep and deep uh into all these metrics and for me this is what's interesting interest me a lot because it gives you a good sense of your, the health of your academy and a kind of a projection of if you are good at these lagging metrics. So first, if you are not good at this one, you can have some tactics to, to improve the system. But if you are good at this on these leading metrics, you can expect success in the medium term rather than just, okay, we are not making money from the academy. To be honest, this is good or bad, but didn't give me any solutions, any tactics to start working on. So this is where we need to be super careful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think working with the academy, it's I I've personally been very blessed. Um, Benfica, it's a great academy. Atalanta is also a great academy. I think I've been very blessed to be in well-oiled machines, so haven't really had to do much to actually make them successful. They they were very successful before I even joined. Um, so maybe instead of giving you a measurement of success, uh, a measurement of maintenance, I guess, um, is really doing like a McKinsey or like strategic, like management consultancy or strategic consultancy type review of where is your talent coming from. What age groups are you getting dropout rates? Like, what what age groups are you having your highest dropout rates? Um, even if you don't have data, but you just use like very well structured coach evaluation forms or even player self evaluation forms, which age groups is your academy actually really like putting the spark into that player? So, for example, maybe your academy is really good at developing U fifteen to U seventeen or U fifteen to U nineteen. Um, whereas another academy is actually really good U20, U19 to U23. Um, and I think the biggest difference, that I, and, and the reason why these things are really important is the biggest difference I'm seeing between Benfica and Atalanta is Benfica had such a natural progression through the age groups to the first team. The jump between 19s to, to 23s to second team to first team was a very organic progression. Um, but in Serie A, uh, making the jump from Primavera, the U19 squad, to the A team, very, very difficult. And so I think it, it's it's more we focus a lot on just KPIs of maintenance of of how does play how do players come into our academy, how do they leave our academy, 
Um, if we only have a finite number of resources for youth scouting, is there a certain age group that we should really be focusing on where we do our scouting? Is there a certain region that we should really be focusing on? Um, because at the end of the day, and it's no secret, your academy, you can have really good development, but having the best talent, organic talent will always, will always be an important factor. And so um, I, I tend to now focus a lot on what are the key uh, KPIs of maintenance rather than the success metric per se. Um, for yourself, Greg, you were jumping on that sort of idea that Suds has brought in there, sort of the KPIs of maintenance to kind of understand where, always to be on top of understanding where your strengths and weaknesses are as, as an academy. Yeah, I think there's two, two things on this one. Um, Leicester City did a really interesting piece of work with Kitman Labs where they looked at 10 years since e, uh, EPPP had been rolled out in 2012. Um, and what were the uh, uh, all of the key age groups? What were the necessary predictors of success? Um, and over fifty different things, which were psychological, technical, tactical, physical, all of these different measures. The only thing that they could find that was aligned with the prediction of whether that player would break through or not was the amount of game time that they'd had. Um, and that could be because they were just the best player, so they were being played all the time. It could be that they were the most robust and so were able to survive the system. Or it could be that just that the number of games were the what was what actually what helped their education. So there's a further piece of work to do there. Um, but also, I think going back to the work that Suds talked about there about looking at where those players come from, where what what your academy is successful um, at. Um, when we first went into, or when I first went into Norwich in in 2012, we we knew the club had just got Category One status for the first time. But, but Nor Norwich and East England, East of England was traditionally a very, very low production area for talent. Very, very few players, whether it come through at Norwich or other clubs, had ever gone on to play in the Premier League. Uh, one reason is because there are so few clubs there. The population isn't very diverse, isn't very big. And if you failed at Norwich, you often dropped out the system because there wasn't another club in the city you could go to. The nearest club was, was Ipswich, which was 50, 50 miles away. So um, what we began to do was look at it. And I, worked, I, I brought a guy in who was brilliant for us called Jason Ito, who's now head of or very high up in the data system at Arsenal. And Jason wrote a study for us um, in 2012 about hotbeds of talent and where we should be focusing. And based on that, we, we, based, we, we put all of our resources into three development centres in London, uh, Lewisham, Greenwich and Walthamstow, I think were the three areas put full-time staff into those areas, heavily recruitment into those areas, built a support structure to get those players up on the train uh, into Norwich, formed a partnership with a private school so that 14, we could then relocate them to the city. But then that goes back to what Matthew talks about, because you can be doing all that work and those players aren't still breaking through to the first team. I think four players from that system, uh, that, Norwich, that, that London recruitment system, made Premier League debuts for Norwich last year in the Premier League. Uh, six of them are around Norwich's first team squad now, but that takes time and it takes energy and it takes support and you have to stick with it because if you cut it at any stage, everyone will say, well, that was just a complete waste of time. But that work was completely based upon the data that, that Jason had done on looking over 20 years of Premier League history, what the hotbeds of talent were and then how, what was the support network we could do to bring those players to Norwich. What we also found was that the big clubs in London were focusing a lot of time and energy on this battle to sign eight and nine year olds. And then maybe at 15, 16, doing the same. And nobody was really monitoring 12 and 13 year olds in London. So we spotted a gap in the market there. But, but that was a data driven piece of work that, that, that led to that process happening. I mean, guys, I guess if we're sort of sort of into the realms of like functional data we're looking out we've got identifying a problem or a challenge and, and then going out and building up the the data to to support a solution to that um how does that kind of fit in with the realms of we're kind of trying to build a reliable process but then all right i guess that becomes little bumps in the roads where we then specifically have to right go out and see if there is a solution to to this bump in the road or do you still maintain a process maintain the process carry on as as you were hmm. so i would say good good question but uh, maybe it's um 
all comes down to the uh, communication and setting up right expectations. Um, if you start saying that leveraging data in your in your club or leveraging such and such strategy will lead you to success in like six months in football, uh, this is not true. Uh, so I, I I strongly believe that when when we as leaders start communicating insights or decision making, we every time need to set the right amount of expectations uh, and pre-define as well, again, metrics of success and so on. And be very fair from the beginning that, okay, if we are not able to reach this and this and this metrics by whatever, two or two, two three or four years, we need to drop our pivot strategy. So it's, again, all coming down to proper communication, proper expectation settings, proper measurement of the process. And again, cannot be only uh, lagging metrics. You need to have your proper leading metrics in. So I guess your players before reaching out to the first team were high performance in the under 23 or under 19s. So you start to identify even before the, that success was happening. So you need to stick to, uh, to the strategy. And yeah, and from, from, from day one, be ready to pivot if these metrics are not reached within a certain amount of time. This is what I would do. I think um, to market maybe a little bit of the book and to say, I, I, I'm not a really big fan of reading and to say if you only really had time to read uh, bits, bits of it, um, probably the most important sections would be the middle two chapters, which is measuring performance. And then how do you actually do prioritization between what's important versus what's interesting? The rest of stuff is probably, it's important, but it's like quite obvious. Like, obviously you need to have a clear objective. Obviously you need to invest in people and you need to have the right people. But, um, the reason why I say that is, um, and maybe this isn't talked about enough, or maybe it is, but I'm, I'm coming from the data side. It's not talked about enough. Um, I'm on my first fixed term contract uh, in Benfica. I was on an unlimited term contract and whether or not I, I stay or, or leave or whatever happens, I can't predict the future. It really builds into the sort of planning of how do you actually build out projects um, if you're not going to be there 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, and so you really need to understand, like, how do I, how do we build as an organization things that can be used and replicated? Uh, and we stick to that process, as you, as you, as you said, even if it may not be like the ideal or golden solution. Um, and that's just because maybe some people are on an unlimited time at the club. Some people are on a fixed time at the club. And uh, it, it definitely does play uh, an influence into how we might prioritize what processes we, we optimize for and, and what process we, we don't. And so if we do ever see a roadblock um, or we do see something that maybe needs to be addressed, it goes back to what Greg uh, was saying was long-term succession planning then becomes the most important thing. It's like we commit uh, here in my three years, let's say I go somewhere else after three years, here in my three years, I really commit to making sure we develop clear processes that we stick to through thick and thin, through ups and downs, but we make a very clear backlog or we make a very clear assessment of what are all the roadblocks we ran into and what are all the things that do need to be addressed, whether it's with me, if I, if I stay, or whether it's with, with that long-term succession planning with somebody else. And, and passing on the torch is something that maybe from the data side, I don't hear much because most, most of my peers really stay within one place. And, I think Matthew and I are kind of the weird ones who've actually bounced around clubs. <laughs> um, but I think it's an important thing that maybe Greg might be able to shed some more some more light on, um, given his background and experience. Just, just jumping on, on this one, because it's funny because we, we didn't talk about that before we, we said, but one of our key pillars in the, in the department is um, build for long-term purpose. And I, I'm always saying that a successful project might need more than one architect. So we are very easy into um, documentations, transparency, backlogging stuff. So if I'm leaving, I want to be able to pass the ball to the next one. So the next one can hit the floor running 
and not just respend two years discovering everything. And um, it's something I'm very convinced about. Um, we have like more than 100 years old clubs, but we, football is very poor at learning because it's very poor at documenting and sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think in the future, we see more people empower to do that for multiple divisions. So we can see some here and there more head of strategy, chief of strategy, director of strategy. And that's exactly that their role maybe to go on project prioritization, documentation, backlogging, and making sure that these guys have this long-term purpose in mind. And uh, we will see great improvement in the, in the coming years, I, I believe, since to this world. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, I think it's it's like both sets of math said that it's, it's about sticking with that process, but it's about learning along the route, not being so bloody minded that you, you say we're going to do this and stick with it throughout. You have to be, be able to flex it. It, it. It's similar to sailing. You know where you want to go, but you might have to tack in order to get there. Um, and I, I think a, a great example I saw of this was was in my previous club, a Buddha Glimt in the first year because they play a summer season. So the first season was 2018. And at the end of that year, um, the club were back in the in the in the uh, top series in, in Norway, the elite Syrian. And the aim of the club was to become a stable elite Syrian club. But results weren't great. We were drawing a lot of games. Um, performances weren't great. We knew what we wanted to do, but didn't quite have the players in place in order to play that way. So performances were slow and it took us a lot of time to progress the ball. And I think what we found was we were slipping towards the bottom of the table and all of the other six clubs at the bottom six changed the coach and we didn't change the coach. We stuck with him. Um, the, the, the metrics that under, underpin the performances were OK, not brilliant, but were OK. We were we were underachieving a little bit and, and you have to stick stick with it through those hard times because there will always be hard times. Football is such a, a game of fine margins. And like I talked about yesterday in the two games that that I watched. Um, the first game where we played Preston North End, we're clearly the second best team on the field. Um, they've done a brilliant game plan in terms of counteracting our style of play and we didn't adjust to that. Um, but but then the second game in the evening, England did everything right that they could do in that game. They, they For the first time in, in a competitive uh, game against a higher level opposition against the world champions, they went toe to toe with them. Whereas if you look against previous games against Croatia uh, four years ago, against Italy last summer, We've always been second best on the day and felt almost cheated to get to extra time or to get to penalties. Whereas last night you dominate, but still fall short. So should England tear the whole thing up? No, of course they have to review the whole thing and say what was good, what was not good. But, but ultimately you've seen huge progress and it is those fine margins in football. And that's why we're all so addicted to the sport because it produces some of the unbelievable stuff that we've seen in Qatar over the last four weeks. So. You know, we've kind of highlighted a few examples where where data will then come in in terms of them we're communicating that all right there will, as you know football's very volatile there's going to be there's always extreme reactions to to defeats or sort of bad runs of form so where those data then when you're going toward to the decision makers that allows you to make those decisions or with the example that that greg gave uh when he's at norwich and you're going to the to the to the sort of owners of the club and asking them to invest sort of various amounts of money in a region away from the club when a very family run club that's a a big a big ask i imagine so where is the data how how can we use the data to build those narratives when we're sort of talking up and down throughout throughout the club how is that increasingly helping it to support maintain the process when there are people getting a little bit nervous and also then when you're you know looking to ask owners for investment for them to sort of invest in various parts of the club i think it's um it, it's having data to support it and then it, most importantly as with all things in life it's just understanding people because some people are very very data literate and want to know every last granular detail and will ask for even further levels of detail and some people don't want to know the data at all. They want to know that you've done your research to get to that decision, 
but they just want to know the big picture stuff and they want to see the pictures especially if you're dealing with coaching staff i find that the, the data needs to be there to support it but for most coaches they want to know the key piece of information why are you putting this player forward why is your analyst team saying that this particular phase of play needs to be addressed differently? Because every time our central midfielder gets the ball, he tends to play left rather than right. So, so sometimes then you have to just uh, prepare that information for the context that you're, you're presenting it to. Yeah, on, the, on the back of that, Suns, I guess, you know, as a data provider, uh, it can, I guess, sometimes be discouraging that if there's people who are not that interested in, in the data, it's not their their field but again you still have to do your due diligence you still have to have that broad level of data understanding and and then to understand for each individual okay this is how i present to them i mean i guess that is continues to be the challenge for people working within data in football um i think I'll use Benfica as a really good example. Um, I mean, uh, my team and I, like the team that we have there, uh, we spent four or five years building a lot of infrastructure in place, working very closely with the video analysts, working very closely sometimes with 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 other other key people in the in the organization. Um, and it's only after I left <laughs> that. Uh, that they bring in a German coach, they bring in a German oriented coach who, who's been trained in the Red Bull system. And the Red Bull system is very known for, for having very modern thinking uh, coaches uh, and, and executives. And everything that we've been working on, like maybe maybe the, the percentage of, of what the club used during my stint there was, let's say, X percent. Um, but the percentage of what they use now is like three times X or four times X. And I think the most important thing uh, is actually a, a quote from Arsene Wenger, and Wenger is my favorite, my favorite coach, my, my, one of my favorite entities or identities in football. And he says that the main thing that makes or breaks a player, uh, especially when you're in that ta very talented elite group, um, are the players that have a high resistance to frustration. And it, it is quite easy to say like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm someone that works in data. I really only want to work with people who understand data. I only really want to work with people who uh, maybe are not having a math, like someone like Greg. I only really want to work with people like Greg. He, he's, not, he's not from a math uh, background, but he's really engaged with the process. Um, and I think it's very easy for data people to, and, and, and no blame to it, by the way, just want to be on record to say that there's no blame on that. Um, but I think I think if we're trying if we're trying to really move the industry forward on all levels, on all geographies, on 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 a on a global level, I think the most important thing is to is to be patient and to go back to what Greg and Matthew say, is not always work on the fancy metrics, not always work on the fancy KPIs, but really spend a lot of time translating football language, football concepts into data. Um, a good example could be like a lot of people want to play with high rhythm. But how do you define high rhythm? Like, do you have a metric that actually lets you assess or evaluate what high rhythm means? Um, a lot of people want to play with numerical advantages. OK, do we have a metric that, that does that? And, and I think I think the data, the data world sometimes gets caught up with fancy machine learning models, which have its value. But it gets lost in translation to the, the key people that work in football that we work with every day. Whereas if you actually show them side by side video with a metric that you calculated and that metric just happens to be the exact same concept that they talk to their video analysts about, that they talk to their players about. Maybe now it's not, maybe it's just not being used for whatever reason, but like in a place like Benfica, now the coach is knocking on the door asking for a lot of stuff all the time. And I think it, it's really a, a language translation thing and a patience thing. And, and to what Wenger says, just a, a high resistance to frustration. Um, we'll, we'll see data be integrated in the, in the long term. All right. Totally aligned with what <laughs> was saying. Just sometimes because we can't do things, 
uh, we are pushing to get more and more and more complex model without empathizing with the, again, decision maker, coach, sporting director, but okay, what do you care about? What do you need? And then, how can I bring the right amount of information on this? If you start doing this, then you create trust. And then from trust, you create a balance of, okay, I will react to your need, but I, I will feel empowered to be a bit more proactive and educate you on more complex things. Uh, but I still remember when I, when I just, when I joined Parma, we, we, we just started the project and my, um, the ownership group was just sometimes pushing on my, my boss who was the managing director of sports saying, yeah, but he's not using uh, data enough. He's not using your tools enough. And I was like, okay, First, I need to be able to deliver value to this guy. If I'm delivering value on what's matter for him, you'll see it will start to use. Now it's not the right moment. We need to create trust. We need to create working process together. And I need, even as a data guy, to spend more time on building this. And then you'll see it's going to be much more effective. So I, again, frustration when I see all these sometimes friends, peers that are getting more and more frustration. Like I'm, I'm building stuff and people are not using this. Maybe you are not building the right stuff for you. You know? So yeah, again, we, we will never replace sporting director or coaching on making decisions. Never. Uh, so they are the one in charge. They are the one that put their face in the critical decision making process. So we just we just need to solve their needs. If we solve their needs, they will use it. I mean, as the as the irreplaceable one, Greg, uh, uh, you're the one with with the needs. I didn't, but again, I guess you're an end user. But also, then you have people above you who you have to report to as well. But I just wonder whether to start with that initial process. I mean, you've mentioned little bits today that. Yeah, understanding uh, yeah, the performance of of your team. There's clearly metrics that you've referred to there. I mean, how when you're understanding how the club is performing, as Suds and Matthew would say, they could deliver infinite amount of data for you. What are the very how are you deciding on right? This is the key bits I need to know on a day to day sort of basis, and then what are the then obviously when you're coming to the bigger strategic decisions then you, you you become more more wider in your base yeah well we're, we're working on a project to build that dashboard so at any time we can see kind of live what that looks like for us as a club um especially on the sporting side um and i think again and it's just constant communication about performance uh all of the time we, we need to switch the language to talking about performance we're coming slightly away now from the from the data part to the psychological part, but obviously everything's intertwined. And again, I think I saw um, probably the biggest one of the biggest learnings I had um, in, in Norway was the use of the of, of the mental coach, a, a brilliant guy called Bjorn Mansvak, who didn't have a ba background in football, but was 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 a fighter pilot, and basically just swapped the whole first team's thinking about how they approached it by every time if you hear an interview with one of the players or the coach they'd be talking about performance performance wasn't good enough or performance was good today and again it's getting the owners and, and, and the stakeholders in the club to reflect the same way uh first four games of the season we won all four games but performances were mediocre so we try not to get carried away next three we lose the three games one of the performances is good the other two are are not good and we try not to be at the bottom and thinking oh my god we need to change everything so I think if you could get people to reflect on performance um, uh, constantly and, and then you have your measures that underpin that, so it's not just, a, it's more objective than subjective how you're discussing it, then I think you're putting yourself into a, into a good place. And then you've got that psychological piece alongside that in terms of how you're working with your players, how you're getting them to frame their language and how you're getting them to think about the game. Uh, it, it concerned me 
uh, and we've raised this internally that I saw a lot of interviews with our players in the press last week after coming out of the international window. We just lost our game against Burnley before the window. We need to get back on it. We need to win games now. We need to start winning again. And it's just like that, that for me now. I, I, there was red flags going into the game yesterday. And there, there's some conversations we need to have internally about that this week. Because if we're just focusing on winning, then I, I think ultimately we're going to set ourselves up to fail. There's, there's probably a brilliant two-by-two two matrix that can come off of the back of what Greg said. Um, I think one, one aspect of it is like um, I, I spend a lot of my time getting people to think in expected terms, not in actual terms, which is what which is exactly what he was saying. But you also cannot disregard what's actually happening. <laughs> um, and uh, there is probably and, and uh, I have to thank you, Greg, for actually saying it like that, because maybe I'm going to spend today thinking about is there like a two by two matrix that you can create from it? Because like maybe the expected versus actual message, the triangulation of the messages is, is this. But you can't deny the fact that maybe you've lost four of your last five games and that that. that and, and despite, and, and even if you lost for the last five games, but your expected metrics are still saying everything is okay, there is still some sort of a psychological factor, maybe, or there's something that's going on that's an intangible, immeasurable thing that's going on. Maybe there is something really important to, to etch out and, and create a framework on regarding how would you handle if things are going expected well, but psychologically well, expected not so well, but psychologically well, ex uh, expected actual well psychologically not well actually actual not so well and psychologically not so well um maybe there's something nice a little tidbit to, to a heuristic to create from that so i have to thank you greg that was nice yeah, yeah I, I i spoke with phil giles at brentford and he talked brilliantly about it uh, two things from phil giles's message very very quickly was firstly um after I, I mean when the head coach went in there the current head coach they lost or didn't win for 10 games and the assistant manager was getting really, really stressed because he'd relocated his whole family over from Denmark. And, and Phil and Rasmus, who was at the club at the time, were saying, look, actually, the performances are OK. Just stay calm. Keep doing what we're doing. We know results will turn. But secondly, he said to me that one of the biggest changes they made at Brentford was taking promotion as a target off the table at the beginning of each season mm -hmm. because of the stress that caused, especially going into the last 10 games. All they talked about was consistently improving performance. And they have a metric that they talk about. They have one metric at Brentford and they know if that metric is going up, then performances are going up. So yeah, it goes back to, to, to some of the stuff you just talked about there. That's really good. Lovely. It seems we're, time is getting the better of us. We're just uh, rounding round, probably need to start rounding things up. So finally, uh, Matthew, I think we're very much there. Like you say, we're trying to say, how can data teams can encourage the the decision makers some more to expand their their use of data and I think there's a little bit there I think around the idea of of communication how I guess how how you start thinking more in objective terms rather than subjective oops this 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 is a good one and um I'm not sure it's a good one. It's a it's a one that we can solve in in days of with process. Everything comes back to trust, uh, and uh, we certainly and I uh, moving from from countries recently. We we know sometimes how long change management can be, uh, but uh, as a I would say as a data guy, you need to have your storytelling right uh you need to have your vision of what you want to achieve and go on it uh creating the trust with the with the with the right people communic communicating the right message days in days out and uh the more you go into this the more you start to have people opening to it coming into your world and then it's where you can start diving into uh, into more interesting things, or where you start to be confident enough to say to people, "Okay, I know you believe in this, but now I'm showing you that you're wrong or not fully right." And uh, it takes time, 
uh, it needs trust, but uh, you 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 can go to it. Um, I think I think the beauty the beauty of being a data person or the beauty of being a data oriented person in in sport is that. Uh, and it also applies to actually being a, a well-organized scout. You know, actually, uh, there's, there's a scout I've recently met in Atalanta who I've been quite inspired by, actually, <laughs> just because of how um, how organized he's been throughout the years. <laughs> and there is something that's good being a database person because one thing that we always have to remember is that we're not the key decision maker. We're just helping people make decisions. Um, so maybe the data says something, but we, we make a decision that's the contrary and we have to be okay with that. Um, but we should still keep a very good archive and a very good system, like the ability to have a very systematic review of we made this decision and it went in this direction, but at the time of making such decision, information told us X. Now, whether we made the decision based on data or not, that's a separate story. Um, there's a lot of things that go, that go on. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest thing that we can do. And, and it's probably one of the things that was reinforced to the scout is the scout. He's now, I think in his late sixties, been scouting for 30 years. And he just has a very clear archive of all players he's scouted for the last 30 years. And here are the ones that hit really well. Here are the ones that I said were not going to be good players, but they actually turned out to be really good players. And he constantly is learning from his self-reflections. And I think data, to, 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 to mend or to merge objective subjective data can play a really strong part there by, by being a strong archiver of at the time the decision was made. Of course, data might not be what's used at the time of the decision. There's other things that go on. Um, but what did data say at that time? What, what was the objective view at that time when the decision was made? And, and can, we actually, can we actually reduce the, the number of systemic errors that we make? Maybe we buy a player and he doesn't work out, but maybe it was just like a, a freak accident or something like that. But maybe we're, we're consistently buying players that don't work out and, and we're able to then find the systemic error as to, as to why that's actually happening. Um, but but it's, it, it's a process, it's a very long process as Matthew, Matthew said. I'll uh, give the last word uh, to Greg. And I guess um, you, you kind of, you're open, you're at the point where you're already open-mindedness to to this way of way of working but you know, what were when people came to you with with the idea of using data what was it that opened your mind to like yeah this is the way to go um i think it's just gradual exposure to it over the last 10 years 10 to 15 years of my career and realizing how critical it is but i think it also goes back to something we discussed earlier is that if you're going to do it do it properly and embrace it and include those people in the decision making process because there's nothing worse than, than people not feeling they have autonomy or, or mastery of what they're doing. You're setting the whole system up to fail. So the same as any other area, it doesn't matter whether it's data, sports, science, whatever area of that club is, if you're going to do it, embrace it and include those people in the decision-making process. Fantastic. That's a, a strong, positive end to uh, today's Sunday session. So uh, thank you, Greg. Thanks, thank everybody. You, Thanks. And thank you, Suds. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot.